Hi there, I'm Dr. Jennifer Jackson. I'm a registered nurse and an assistant professor in the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Calgary. And this video is part two of a conversation about ethics in research, particularly in nursing research. And um, we're going to talk about the legacy of bad research and how it has impacted um, the research and the work we do today. This is the hardest lecture I ever give because the stuff we have to talk about is, is quite toxic, frankly. But I think it's really important that we're aware of what has happened in the past. And so A, we can contextualize some of the things that have been done in research, and B, we can prevent that type of behavior from happening again. So um, I want to give everybody a content or trigger warning. This section, we're going to talk about the Holocaust, um, racism, sexism, violence, and, and frankly, some like pretty awful things that have been done to people in the name of research. And again, I'm not trying to be gratuitous with this, but I think we, we need to be able to look into that blackness to say, to fully acknowledge the harm that can be done, and to also make sure that we're not perpetuating harm when we're doing research. So there is a long legacy of bad research out there, and it has taken lots of different shapes and forms. So some of it has been kind of minor ethical violations right up to like actually depraved things that humans have done to one another. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the like most prominent unethical studies. If you would like a horribly depressing Wikipedia spiral, you can look into any one of these in more detail. But um, I think it's important to know, like we have to know where we came from, even though it's uncomfortable. So when we're talking about bad research, there's been lots of times where experimenters um, or scientists did not follow ethical principles like autonomy, justice, beneficence, and non-maleficence. Um, they did voyeuristic research um, just for the hell of it. They did colonial research, um, things that caused grave harm to participants and generally degraded the humanity of the people that they were working with. So first example I have here is the Tuskegee syphilis study. So this was a study that started when we have no known cure for syphilis. So syphilis is also often associated as a sexually transmitted infection, and it is, but it also is, it's basically spread by close contact. So if you contact a syphilitic lesion, you can gain syphilis. So often those lesions are, you know, near someone's genitals and thus it's sexually transmitted. But, you know, you could also have syphilitic lesions like on your arm. And if someone touched your arm, they could have syphilis as well. So it's highly, highly contagious. But nowadays, very easily treated with antibiotics. Um, you know, you get some antibiotics, you're fine. It, there's no lingering effects and you can move on. This study started when there was no treatment for syphilis. And what the researchers wanted to do was study whether syphilis in Black African Americans was similar to syphilis in white, um, like colonial Americans. And so, A, they didn't really need to do this study um, because it was for the sort of the idea of like, Black people are other, Black people are different, and therefore they may have this disease differently. And um, that, that first assumption was flawed. But they also said, okay, we want to see what the natural life of syphilis is. So if you contract the disease and you receive no treatment, how, how does it end up? And it can lead to your death. It can cause encephalitis and cognitive impairment and all kinds of things if left unchecked. So they started following um, men with syphilis. And ultimately, these men um, infected... Uh, their partners, sometimes their children, other people in the household also often contracted syphilis. And um, the study, and they were offered free health care in the study, which many of the people who would have been recruited for this study would have had low socioeconomic con um, contexts and not a lot of access to health care. So the offer of we're going to give you health care 
was perhaps a disproportionate um, incentive to participate in the research. So the people also weren't told fully what was happening with this experiment. So the experiment went on and a treatment for syphilis was discovered. So now we can end syphilis essentially, give someone some antibiotics, they feel a lot better, they move on. The researchers didn't want to stop their study. They wanted to see what it looked like when um, black men would die of syphilis, if it was different than what white men would experience. And so they did not tell the participants that there was treatment available. And in the end, the participants died of a treatable condition. So for the sake of this sort of misguided, racist, wanting to do reporting, the um, participants were denied medical care and ultimately died from a treatable illness. There was also huge consequences for their families, for other people in their community, and um, it goes down and the legacy as one of the most racist experiments that's ever been conducted. Unfortunately, um, the harms were not restricted to Black men. Um, our, modern, our modern field of gynecology, uh, like OBGYNs, was most of the work to establish that was um, done by, you know, racist doctors using Black women. They would um, do surgeries like hysterectomies with no anesthetic because they thought Black people don't feel pain. Um, they would, you know, have black women expose their genitals and then have, you know, the local townsfolk could take a look. And there was a lot of othering and a lot of sexualization of black women. And we still see legacies of that in our culture today. But it's important to know that like gynecology came from this horrible background. And so that doesn't mean we don't practice gynecology now but we have to acknowledge where it is that we came from. And same with, you know, when we think about research studies like Tuskegee, as soon as you say that word, most researchers, it just, it just makes your skin crawl because you know the harm that was done in the nature of this sort of voyeuristic racist work, if you can even call it work. So that is one biomedical example. Um, the Stanford prison experiment and the Milgram obedience experiments were a little bit different because um, they focused less on a racial divide and more on sort of psychological torture and impact. So the Stanford prison experiment was where they took a group of undergraduate students and they wanted to mimic a jail. So they put I think it was 20 undergraduate males were the prisoners and 20 undergraduate males were the prison wardens. And they were randomly assigned to those two groups. The researchers built like physical jail like space and just said, okay, now you're in charge, like you were in charge of these people go. And the students were to mimic this prison environment. Um, it escalated wildly out of control and had to be stopped early um, because the, uh, the prison wardens were being so aggressive and violent towards the prisoners that you know, they were beating them and making them stand at attention for all these hours. And in a lot of ways, this experiment, this experiment was kind of showing like the blackness of man's heart, if you will, of just, how influential these power dynamics can be. What sometimes gets lost is that um, the prison warden group was actually egged on quite a bit to behave that way. And sometimes that's been overlooked. So, um, but it caused substantial, I mean, physical, but mostly psychological harm to the people who were participating. Um, thankfully the experiment was stopped early, but I think it was probably a traumatizing experience for everybody who was involved. Um, the Milgram obedience experiments were to try and assess whether, um, you know, the idea of during World War II, some of the people who were Nazis at their trials um, said, you know, I was just following orders. 
And so that was said over and over. So Milgram was kind of interested in this idea of like how persuasive is an authority figure in making someone follow orders. And I think in the heart, our heart of hearts, we would all like to think I would never have done anything bad to anyone else. I would never have, you know, been a Nazi or participated in any of that, those activities. I would have stood up to people and that is not me. And actually Milgram's exper um, experiments kind of showed that there is some of that in all of us. So what he did was have research or have the research participants come in and it was told that they were teaching people in another room to do a series of tasks. So what they were doing was they had a board where they would press buttons and it would, um, and it would deliver an electric shock to the person in the other room. Now, the person in the other room was not actually being shocked. They were what's called a confederate. So somebody who works with a researcher to kind of create an environment to see how people react. So that person was not actually being harmed, but the participant thought they were administering electric shocks. And as the voltage of the shocks went up, the person in the, the Confederate would scream, bang on the wall, scream that they needed help. And the researcher would stand there in a white coat and tell people, no, you have to keep going. No, you have to keep going. And the idea was to see whether that white coat, you know, person saying, no, you have to keep going, whether that would be enough of an authority figure to have participants continue pressing the shock button, even though no one was being shocked. Um, every single participant went past the point where the person in the other room started yelling for help. So some of them didn't go all the way to the highest level of electric shocks, but every single person continued past the point of when the person started yelling for help. They kept going beyond that. So that study goes to show that like there was something valuable that was learned there in that, you know, how does that translate to how authority figures can be used to coerce or influence individuals to do things that they normally wouldn't. So that learning is not necessarily all bad, but the process of making someone think that they are shocking someone else in another room, potentially to the point where that other person could die from those electric shocks, that is extremely unethical. So nowadays we have other ways of assessing, you know, the influence of authority figures without making people feel like they're hurting another human being. So this is an example. I've included this example because, you know, there might be like a little grain that we could take from that that is interesting to reflect on about human nature and sociology and psychology. But the way that information was achieved was really unethical. And so we have to be extremely careful in reflecting on how all of this came to be. Um, the final example I've included here is Mengele's um, experiments at Auschwitz. And unlike the prior example, there is no grain of benefit that can be derived from this. Um, these are some of the most disgusting and depraved things that have ever been done by one human being to another. Um, by all accounts, um, Mengele was extremely disturbed, sadistic, um, racist, pro-eugenics, like you name it, he was, he was a very disturbed individual. So, um, I have been to Auschwitz. I've seen where they did the experiments and things, and it, it's it's it, it kind of exceeds my capacity for words because it's so upsetting. So I just want to say that they had basically two kinds of experiments. One were military-based experiments, and so these included things like um, testing nerve gas on um, prisoners at Auschwitz to see if their gas masks worked. Um, they also did experiments like where they would have people wear different kinds of rubber on the bottom of their shoes and make them walk in circles until they collapsed. And the purpose was to 
test the rubber on the shoes and see which type of rubber was more resilient. So those experiments are extremely harmful and depraved and there's like no, there's no accepting that under any circumstances. The thing about those ones is there was a very sick kind of logic applied there. So we want to test out different types of shoes for our soldiers. Like I'm not condoning that in any way at all. However, you can see that there is, there is an attempt at logic. It's extremely misguided and extremely harmful, but there is an attempt there. The other thing that happened at Auschwitz that was arguably more horrifying was the experiments that did not have any backing whatsoever. No matter how many mental calculations you did, there's no way to possibly justify this. So this was directly, the stuff directly under Mengele's purview. And this included, like he did a lot of experiments with twins, um, do surgery on one of them to remove their kidneys and then use the other twin as a control. There was no anesthetic, you know, and this twin inevitably died, but they could compare the two twins. And then um, after the one twin had died, they would kill the other one and, you know, write it up as uh, experiments. They tried to sew twins together to create conjoined twins. They tried to do all kinds of things. I'm not going to talk about it anymore, but, but there are things that had absolutely no purpose whatsoever. There was no line of logic that could ever be um, determined through that. And because of that, once those experiments were revealed, it really it shocked the world and it really made researchers realize we have to be more accountable and we have to do better because this kind of thing cannot happen ever again. And so that that is an important motto about the whole Holocaust, never again. But it also applies very specifically to the experiments at Auschwitz because they were so horrifying that they there was just, we had to kind of collectively come together as humanity and say, we'll never go back to that brink. Now the Tuskegee study, the Stanford study and the Milgram study all happened after this reckoning within the research community. So unfortunately, this is still something that's evolving. We haven't gotten all the way to having good ethical research uniformly all the time, um, but at least we're getting there. Um, also just a note, uh, Mengele escaped to um, South America and he died peacefully of old age. He was never, um, he was never tried and never convicted of any of his crimes and he essentially got away with everything he did. So um, that still boils my blood to this day, but I think the most important things we can do is to say that for all the people who suffered as part of these studies that we, we don't forget about what happened and we don't forget the harm that was caused to them and we make sure that we honor them by doing ethical research as we move forward. One other point to make is that these were all um, 20th century studies. And sometimes I think it's tempting to say like, oh, everyone was racist back then, everyone was horrible back then, everyone meaning white people generally. Um, but, you know, we're so much more enlightened now, we're so much better now, and we don't do those kinds of things. There's still lots of unethical research that happens to this day, and it's not something in the distant past, it is still a very current issue. So, um, for example, Wakefield, as soon as I say that name, I think most researchers immediately become irate because um, Wakefield was a doctor. He's since had his medical license removed, but he published a study in The Lancet, which is one of the top medical journals in the world about how the MMR vaccine was associated with autism. So that study has been completely debunked. All the other authors on the paper have asked to withdraw the study. In that study, there was an N of 12. So there were 12 people who were, um, you know, the participants in the study. So from 12 people, there's no possible way that you could make a population level assessment that the MMR vaccine is associated with autism. However, that message 
somehow cut through to reach many, many people. And even though that study was A, unethical, and B, just like quite poor quality, um, you probably know the word I'm thinking of here, um, it still, it was, it was just seized upon and used by people who wanted to justify anti-vaccine positions to the point where um, pre-COVID, that study was directly associated with the deaths of over 3,000 people. And they, like, who knows how many, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions more may have died as a result of that anti-vaccine um, legacy that was sparked by this Wakefield paper. And Wakefield remains completely unrepentant. He's on Twitter talking about all kinds of things and, um, you know, is absolutely shameless about things and acknowledges none of the harm he's done. So research is still something we have to be very, very careful because there can be a lot of harm and um, it's continuing today as much as that um, bothers me immensely. So, um, after the experiments at Auschwitz and other places were discovered, um, there had, there was a response and we said, look, we, we, we can never go back to that. We must do better. So the Nuremberg Code of 1947 was created saying that we had 10 standards that were based on, you know, moral, ethical, and legal obligations that we had as researchers and medical practitioners. So these these principles from that code still form the basis of all of, you know, our CARNA regulations, um, all the nursing regulations around the world, they have descended from that code. The focus is on informed consent and why that's important is in all of those studies that we've talked about, consent was a problem. So people were not being fully informed of what they were participating in and they did not have the right to leave the study, stop doing the research, step back from things. They didn't have those options. They were only um, given the opportunity to, uh, to be in it or you know, presumably they'd be killed in, in some cases. So people have to be able to consent and know what the research is, what you're trying to achieve, what is expected of them, and, um, and the fact that they can leave if they do not want to participate in it anymore, and there are no consequences for them because of that. So that is now the fundamental value of all of ethical codes relating to research. So the Declaration of Helsinki is very specific to medical research. Um, this is a required reading, is that this has been updated often, but this basically sums it all up as to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in research, and it sets the standard internationally for everything that happens. Now, this is not always followed, but I take very seriously that if I'm a professional, I have to adhere to the professional standards that regulate my practice. And thankfully, most of the other researchers also follow this same guideline, and this forms the basis of what we do. In Canada, we have specifically the TCPS2, which is the Tri-Council Policy Statement, the second edition that um, governs research that's conducted in Canada, is very closely associated with the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, in different countries, in different places, there's different versions of um, these guidelines, but the same principles still apply, that we have to have a good reason for doing what we're doing, we have to minimize harm, ensure informed consent, and maintain justice and equity in all the work that we do. So we need to also think about bad research. This has a legacy. Just as colonialism has a legacy or sexism has a legacy, bad research, which is informed a lot by, or was informed by colonialism, sexism, racism, all of those things, that still has impacts in the nursing work we do, in the research we do, and all kinds of things. 
So to do research in a modern setting, it takes a lot of approvals. And sometimes I admit that I get frustrated with all of those approvals because it can take six months to get them all in place. However, I try and remind myself that those approvals are there for a very good reason. And they are there to protect the participants. It's not a comment on your research. It's not you know, about your qualifications as an academic. It is there to protect the participants. So just like colleges, regulatory colleges are there to protect the public, um, this, these like approvals and ethics boards that we have are there to protect participants. So I think it's also important, I encourage you to just take a minute. Sometimes we hear like, why are some people hesitant to access COVID-19 vaccines? I think that some people may be anti-vaxxers and we need to be aware of the motivations behind that type of argument. But lots of people, I have great empathy for the fact that they do not want to really partake in something that's new and hasn't been tested for a long period of time because there is a long history of experimenting on women and people in racialized groups and people with mental illness. And it's very, very ugly and they have good reason to hesitate. And I completely understand that. So part of what we can do is try and build trust in the work that we're doing, but also recognize that people's feelings are legitimate and that we have to be reflective as researchers as to where this climate was created and how people got here. So like clinical practice, there's a legacy of bad things that have happened in the past. But each of us can be an agent for change, you know, whether you're a research assistant, whether you're a peer student over the summer, whether you're participating in, you know, any number of things, you can ask questions, you can say, what about this group, that group that might not be included, and you can kind of quietly rattle the cage or loudly rattle the cage at any level to make sure that we're aware of the legacy of bad research and that we're pushing towards good research that is informing our best practices. So um, if you've made it this far, well done on getting through this very difficult lecture. And um, I hope that you can take a minute to take care of yourself. This has been some pretty graphic material we've talked through. Um, thank you for your understanding that there are lots of unfortunate things in our past that we need to be aware of and let's let our awareness drive change. So in the final installment of this um, seminar, we're gonna be talking about how we do ethical approval today and what we can do to make sure that our current research practice is ethical.